education has to be the key in this. For a farm to be the primary health care provider, it needs to have high-functioning soils. And there's wonderful information now to show that advanced function in plants only comes from highly developed, high organic, high mineralized soils. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions and Food Farming and the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Hilda Labrada Gore. This is episode 74, and my guest is Doug Flack. Doug is dedicated to producing nutrient dense food in the context of the farm and community he lives in in Vermont. He and his wife, Barbara, run the Flack Family Farm, a small but diverse farm that is certified organic through Vermont Organic Farmers. Doug digs deep on today's topic since he lives what he's talking about. He is a hands-on guy working on the farm, and he's also a scholar. You will be intrigued by his story, his depth, and the people and books that have influenced his life. You will also be challenged, as I know I was by his musings on how nutrient-dense food and soil function affect our future and, of course, our health. Before we get into the conversation, we want to thank our sponsors. Wise Traditions is supported in part by Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant, the probiotic everyone's talking about. Go to thriveprobiotic.com. And listeners like you, we want to encourage you to stay in touch with us. If you are enjoying the podcast, There is more where this came from. We post articles, action items, and timely news pieces on our social media platforms. Look for at Weston A. Price on Twitter and Instagram. And on Facebook, just look for the Weston A. Price Foundation. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Doug. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. I'm really excited about our topic today, and I want to kick it off by diving deep into your own story. You told me that your wife, uh, in your early years of marriage, had a problem with wisdom teeth, and this led you to the Weston A. Price Foundation. Do tell us that story. Yes, the wisdom tooth uh, impactions, were two of them, were so bad that afterwards she couldn't open her mouth for more than a week and couldn't eat, so I fed her with a straw. Hold and, on. Uh, How does a wisdom y- tooth get impacted? What does that even mean? They can't emerge normally. They get stuck in the jaw under the gum tissue, and you know they lead to all sorts of serious issues if they're not removed. Oh, so how did they remove them? Didn't you tell me something about a hammer and a chisel? <laughs> yes. Yeah, this was in the 60s, and I don't know how they would do it today, but they just hammered them out, and it created a lot of trauma. I guess so. And then you said she had to eat through a straw? Yeah, for a long time, you know, at least a week or longer. I mean, you know, it's a long, more than 50 years ago, so. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, how did this prove to be some kind of wake-up call for you? What did you learn from this situation? I was a student, a uh, graduate student in Madison, Wisconsin, in zoology and botany and evolutionary biology, and it was really clear to me that this was not a normal human condition, that there was something about modern life that had created this condition, because someone of reproductive age would not survive this. They shouldn't have to go through that, is what you're saying. It wasn't where she was meant to be. She should be really strong and fertile and fine at that age, right? Yeah, and the teeth should come in normally. So this was a very extreme abnormality. So then did you decide, okay, we've got to get back to how things used to be? Is that what you proposed well, to yourself? Well, you know, I'm kind of a slow learner, so so it took a long time to, but I fought on this for decades, and, and eventually I discovered West St. Price's work and realized that diet was the cause of her impactions and other tooth problems, too. So we went from there. Wow. So let's go back to the time before the modern times. Let's go back to the Paleolithic era, because I know you've talked about these things. What was it like to nourish ourselves back then? That's a wonderful question, and it brings to mind a, a very recent scientific study 
that showed that more than 30% of our DNA is about our ability to smell, taste, and determine texture of food. And that's really big. And if you add in the sight, the visuals, you know, we're looking at more than half of our DNA is about those things. And obviously, they're about selecting food. And so in Paleolithic times, people had the advantage of learning about their food through the experiences of their sensory system and through the very slow food knowledge of the culture they lived in. Mm-hmm. So, and we know from Weston A. Price's work that there's just endless ways you can eat if you're selecting nutrient-dense food. In the, you know, the 14 isolated cultures that he studied, they all had perfect teeth and all sorts of other perfections of um, physical and mental health. And there were many, many different diets, but they all were high in fat-soluble vitamins and in minerals, much, much higher than modern food. And there were no industrialized processed foods in their diets. And so those were the key things. And whether they lived at 10,000 feet in the Andes or in the Arctic or on tropical islands, they all accomplished the same wonderful physical and mental health using their their culture and their fully developed DNA system. Even if we don't look back that far, I was looking at some documentary the other day that was showing people from 1918, 1920, and the people looked good. I didn't see anybody in the film who was obese or whose teeth were crooked. So what's happening? Now I look around and all of us need braces and we're struggling with our health. Like, what what was the difference? Yeah, the difference is that we industrialized our farming and food system. And I've got a timeline, maybe it's up on the website, I don't know, but I have a timeline that shows how that really focused in huge changes after World War II. I mean, those changes began before that, but but they became the dominant thing in people's diet. Corn syrup, a high sugar diet, vegetable oils, more refined sugar, pasteurized milk instead of raw milk. And uh, people stopped eating live fermented foods and animal organ meats and animal fats. And the food, uh, the food was demineralized through poor farming practices. So mineral content of the food went down while industrial refined things went up. And it's, um, it's a pretty disturbing picture. Now, Doug, what would you say to someone who would perhaps argue this way? I go to the grocery store and I see food that is, they have added all kinds of minerals and things like we are supercharging our food to make it better than ever. And we have all this medical attention and the latest, like humans are just getting the latest inventions to make us live as long as we can. So we're just getting better and better. We don't need to go back. We should be going forward. What would you say to someone who argues that way? The first thing I would say is, well, maybe those things are partially true. But if you look at the epidemic, and it's a catastrophic epidemic of degeneration, that's occurring in spite of all of these modern ideas about how you process food. And the the work of many people in the 19th and 20th century showed that what you need to eat is nutrient-dense foods that are minimally processed. No matter how you think you can use your science to manipulate food and add back vitamins and minerals, that's not the way nature operates, and we haven't figured that out in the industrial world. And it really is also, I think, looking somewhat through rose-colored glasses, because if you open your eyes wide to the science of the numbers of what's happening to people today, the reproductive failures, the degeneration, as you said, physical degeneration, the chronic diseases people are suffering from, you can't believe that these are just coming out of the blue. I think you're absolutely right. That's beautifully said. And mental illness, these are all epidemic. Yes. 
So we're, we're hurting ourselves, we're killing ourselves, and it may be that instead of looking to the farm as primary health care provider, we are looking to so-called medical professionals or health professionals who aren't really pointing us in the right direction. They're simply trying to treat the symptoms and not address the root cause. So how can we, Doug, how can we make the farm our primary health care provider? Education has to be the key in this. For a farm to be the primary health care provider, it needs to have high-functioning soils. And there's wonderful information now to show that advanced function in plants only comes from highly developed, high-organic, high-mineralized soils. So the typical plant foods that are, that are either fed to our animals or fed to people are coming off very poorly functioning soils. And so the plants aren't, aren't even carrying the nutrient-dense elements uh, that are necessary either for animal health or human health. So farm as a primary health provider starts with high-functioning soils. I know what you're talking about because I met a man who was trying to regenerate the soil and make sure that it was nutrient dense, you know, full of minerals and stuff because he wanted his plants, I think he was growing microgreens or something, but he wanted them to be as powerful and as nutrient dense as possible. Um, Whereas I might just buy from someone who says, oh yeah, these are organic microgreens from some other provider who isn't trying to build up the soil or hasn't even taken the time to turn it over from conventional to organic. And it's not going to have the same nutrient density, even though to my naked eye, they look the same, right? Yes, that's really true. For example, our farm in our county, there's thousands of acres of GMO corn, and they get huge yields. And, uh, you know, it all looks great, but the plants are so deficient in nutrients that the cows are very short-lived and and not in good health. And the same goes for food for people. Because the cows are eating that corn in their grain, yes. in their feed? Yeah. And they don't live as long? Oh, they don't live anywhere near as long. And that's partly because of the diet and partly because they've been selected to produce extraordinary quantities of milk that really are beyond the normal sort of metabolic abilities of an animal unless they're being pumped with uh, food. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. I'm thinking back to what you said a moment ago about nutrient density, though, and I'm remembering that Dr. Oz in a popular Time Magazine article a few years ago said that non-organic food was just as nutrient-dense as organic. Would you go head-to-head with Dr. Oz? (laughs) I sure would. But, you know, I'd start it by saying that um, 80 years ago, most food was just organic because chemical farming did exist for sure that long ago, even a hundred and over a hundred years ago. But but in most areas, it, there were uh, farming practices that produced pretty high quality food. Today, conventional farming can run the gamut of really good practices. Maybe they're not certified, but really smart farmers doing a really good job with soil and producing high quality, nutrient dense food. But largely, the typical conventional farm is using chemical farming, which shortcuts the uh, soil functions that are so necessary for a plant to develop into a fully developed, healthy entity. And, And I would also say that some organic farming practices are not producing the best quality food either because... You know, it's it's a, it's a label, and even though the practices are supposed to aim that way, it takes time and dedication to really come up with great quality soils and therefore high quality plant and animal foods. So I, labels aren't that helpful. I hear you. I hear you, and I I think you're really just bringing to the fore our need for all of us to educate ourselves, a carrot is not a carrot is a carrot. In other words, we want the most nutrient-dense carrot possible. We can't just pick one off the shelf and hope that it was grown in the right soil and the right conditions, even if it has that proper label. Yes. In a moment, Doug talks about the fascinating work of soil scientist William Albrecht. He explored the relationship between soil fertility and human health. 
Now we want to pause and thank our sponsors. Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant. Most probiotic pills just pass through our bodies without achieving the desired effect. Microbiologist Kiran Krishnan, whom I interviewed just a few weeks ago, recommends a spore-based probiotic like Just Thrive Probiotic. If you want to hear Kiran, by the way, just check out episode 69 entitled Improve Your Microbiome. Just Thrive is the first 100% spore-forming probiotic that arrives alive in the intestines naturally. It supports optimal gut health, digestive health, immune health, and it delivers antioxidants. It's great for adults, kids, the whole family. The probiotic everyone's talking about. Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant. Visit their website at thriveprobiotic.com. And listeners like you, we want to keep in touch. Let us know what you liked best about this episode. Use the hashtag WAPF on Twitter or use our Twitter handle at Weston A. Price and give us some feedback. So in a spirit of educating ourselves, Doug, I wanted to ask you, who are some of your influences? You've mentioned Dr. Price, of course, but I know you've done other reading. Can you mention some other books that we could turn to if we really wanted to dig deep into this? Yes. Well, I think one of the most remarkable was William Albrecht, and he actually wrote the first chapter or the introduction to Weston A. Price's, I think, second edition of Mm -hmm. his uh, um, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Mm -hmm. And he was a soil scientist in Missouri who uh, stepped out of the norm and began to investigate the relationship between soil fertility and human health. And he did some amazing studies. And uh, so his fellow soil scientists weren't so happy with him about this. But he was able to map soil quality against human health. And he did that in one study with 70,000 sailors who had uh, been in World War II. And he he got all their dental records and uh, plotted them against the soils that they were raised on. And there was a powerful relationship between dental health and other health factors, but I remember most clearly dental health and the soil that the person was raised on. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. And, uh, wow. Yeah, that's all correct. And he did a lot more. You know, he, like Wesley Price, believed that if we did not uh, wake up to nutrient-dense food and soil function, that there was uh, really a very poor future for humans. Now, there was another powerful uh, influence on me, and uh, that was Villamore Stefansson. He wrote maybe 30 books, but his last was The Fat of the Land Mm. in 1957, and that's just really a powerful book. And what was his main premise, do you think? His premise was very similar to Weston A. Price's, Mm. that nutrient-dense foods were essential for human health. And he experienced that through his work in the Arctic with various Arctic and subarctic peoples. And also a marvelous study that he did as a student in Iceland on bone structure, especially in the, in the face and the jaw. Wow, that is so fascinating. A friend told me recently that I think she has some friends in Serbia, and they say they can always tell when Americans come around not because of their clothing, but because of their faces. And now we do have these very narrow faces that are simply not reaching their genetic potential. But it sounds like some of these authors you've mentioned already foresaw what Price saw, that there is a definite change to the facial structure and to the teeth when the diet is compromised. That's absolutely right. You know, when I first started farming here in Vermont 40 years ago, I used to go to farm auctions, and at that time, many of the farmers were, you know, in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and you look at their faces, and they were all raised on little small dairies and on raw milk and the food they grew themselves, and they all had fully developed jaws and big round faces, Mm -hmm. and that's gone. Oh my gosh, that's so sad. It is really sad. It hurts me to see people in a supermarket filling their baskets with food that got no nutritional value and actually is often slowly poisoning them. All right, Doug, I have to challenge you. What are you doing in a supermarket? (laughs) Uh, Buying toilet paper. (laughs) 
<laughs> Same reason I go there. I'm like, okay, let me just get some paper goods and then I'm out of here. And, you know, even the smell, actually, the supermarket, if you walk into it, once you are on the farm or buying at farmer's markets, when you go in those places now, you're just so alert to the fact that it just doesn't smell natural. You know, it just smells weird. It must be all the scents and all the cleaning products. I don't know, but I just don't like the feel or the look of it or anything. And actually, maybe I'm just going back to the Paleolithic era and I'm using my senses to tell me whether something's good or not. I think that's exactly right. Even the light is bad. Yeah, I agree. Hey, but I wanted to go back to something that you said about Albrecht. You said that his fellow soil scientists weren't happy with him. Why would they be upset at his findings that the soil made a difference in a person's health? Well, I think that's a really good question, and I don't have the answer to it. But what I do know from my own experience is when you step out of the box that you're supposed to be in, um, you're a soil scientist. You are not a nutritionist. Uh, uh, You know, you're not a human behaviorist. You know, that rocks the boat. So that's, that's the only answer I can really give you, and that's something you see over and over again in any field. Well, so tell me, have you rocked the boat in Vermont as a farmer, or are a lot of farmers around you kind of on the same page? Well, um, people do compliment me on bringing up a lot of these issues. I rock the boat in the sense that I'm an activist for the right of farmers to sell their food directly to the public without the state interfering. You know, raw milk is a good example, farm-slaughtered meats, um, homemade cheeses, sausages, pâtés, terrines, all these things that could be produced by a farmer and sold directly to their immediate neighbors and local area. We are prevented from doing that by various regulations that are based on fear Mm -hmm. instead of hope and health. So there I've been rocking the boat. And maybe I was one of the earliest people to bring up these ideas of food and health. But there there are many people that are understanding that now. It's still in its infancy because we still have these supermarkets where almost everyone is poisoning themselves. Oh, my gosh. It's sad. You know, I have a chart in my hand, and it summarizes what I think. And it's called, it's a flower, and it's yellow in the middle, and it has green petals, and it says, our community goals. Uh-huh. And uh, if you're interested, I'll, I'll just quickly go around it. Yes, please do. The first petal on the right upper is healthy pregnancies. And then the next petal to the right and coming down is trouble-free birth. Mm. And then healthy, bright babies. And then fully developed bones and teeth. And then round and going up the left side, healthy, engaged, useful, expressive children and teenagers. And then healthy adults, long life, dignified end of life. And then peaceful, engaged, interconnected communities. And then right on the top, it says solar driven, ecologically integrated, diverse human cultures fostering health for all life forms. And I feel like we can get there if we start with healthy pregnancies. Mm, Just the beginning of life. That's right. Now, are these the community goals of the Flack family farm or of folks in your community there in Vermont? Well, there are some that I've been projecting in my lectures, in my talks. And I I haven't seen anyone adopt something like this. But, you know, I, I think Alan Savory, the holistic resource man, he would completely recognized the importance of this. Oh, yes. We, we love Alan Savory and the Savory Institute. They're just fantastic. And you're right. It, it does all come back to how we manage the land. And, and of course, that impacts our health. So I need to wrap up now, Doug. I want to ask you one final question. If the listener could only do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? Just one thing, you mean? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> does food, is food just one thing? Sure, food can count as one thing. Okay, so I would have them stop using any of the modern processed foods, just completely eliminate that, and add into their diet high-fat animal foods like butter and cream and cheeses, 
and smaller amounts of meats, but particularly uh, things like liver and other organ meats that you might have in pâtés and terrines. Uh, I'd have them using raw milk only because pasteurized milk is another industrialized food and it's not good for people. Yes, so I I would have them eliminate processed foods and add in nutrient-dense foods. And fermented vegetables and other fermented foods should be a regular part of their diet too. If they do all those things, I think the farm really will be their primary health care provider. That's exactly right. Well, yes. thank you for your time, Doug. I want to come and visit you in Vermont. I hope I can. That would be lovely. And I'll tell you that in the fall, and it'll be on our website pretty soon, we invite the public to come and help us make our fermented vegetables. And last year we did 16 tons. So people come at 8 o'clock in the morning, huh? and they work until lunch, and we give them a big lunch of farm food. And then uh, they work in the afternoon, and we send them off with a jar of ferment. And all our secrets, which are wide open. Um, (laughs) And so they get to eat a nutrient-dense meal and learn how to ferment vegetables. That sounds amazing. Well, we will put a link to your website in the show notes. Thanks again, Doug. Great pleasure. Thank you. My guest today was Doug Flack of the Flack Family Farm in Vermont. For more on Doug, his farm, and even his suggested reading list, visit his website at flackfamilyfarm.com. Or just go to the podcast page on the westonaprice.org website. Click on the show notes for episode 74, and you'll find all that you need. Oh, and a big thank you to my intern, Livy Stanforth, for her help with the show notes this week. And thanks, as always, to the team at Podcast Village for audio assistance. They are a stellar team that help people produce and promote podcasts. Check them out at podcastvillage.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with others. Post a link on Facebook or Twitter, or send a link to a friend in an email, or simply review Wise Traditions on iTunes. Sharing the podcast is one way to spread the important message of health through nutrition. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions and Food Farming in the Healing Arts. The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice.